Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, Creating Healthy Habits for a Healthy Lifestyle. My name is Peter Demiri. I am the Vice President of Programs and Services for MSAA and your host for tonight's program. Tonight's webinar is part of MSAA's MS and the Family campaign, and I would like to thank the supporters of the campaign, Celgene and Novartis, for their funding for this program and additional upcoming activities. As you may know, MSAA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today for the MS community. Listed here are just a few of the many free programs and services provided across the country. I encourage you to visit our website or give us a call to learn more about our programs and ways we can help better manage your MS. And lastly, tonight's webinar will be archived on our website at mymsaa.org. As you're watching tonight's program, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them in the chat box on your screen. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the program and try to fit in as many questions as time will allow. Also, if you have any technical issues with the webinar, such as you can't hear the sound or other issues, please type them into that chat box as well, and a moderator will respond. At this time, I am very honored to introduce our guest speaker, Andrea W. Hansen. Andrea is a Master Certified Life and Mindset Coach, best-selling author who wrote the book, Live Your Life, Not Your Diagnosis, that MSAA does feature in our Lending Library program, and the creator of the Autoimmune Rebels Free Online Community. Andrea is also a person living with MS since 2000. Andrea, thank you so much for being here with us tonight, and welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to the MSAA for putting on this program and all the other programs. I know you guys do such a good job, and you put on amazing programs. And thank you for that as someone coming from the MS community. And hello, everybody. I'm super happy to be here. I'm going to be sharing some great actionable information with you tonight. My goal is that you have what you need to start working on a healthier lifestyle as soon as we're done here. So I can't wait to show you how. And, you know, let's go ahead and just dive in. I want to start by telling you a story about a young woman in her early 20s sitting in her neuro-ophthalmologist's office sobbing. She just found out that she had optic neuritis again and needed another round of steroids. She was devastated and so tired of the ups and downs. Her first years of MS weren't going well. She had a lot of relapses and a lot of uncertainty. She was taking lots of time off from work, lots of time away from friends and family because she would hide in her apartment each time she was on steroids because they made her into a completely different person and she was afraid of saying or doing something that she would regret. She was trying to take care of herself but if she were honest, she was stressing out way too much. She was swinging between binging on really crappy foods and then being on super restrictive diets. She was burning the candle at both ends at work and consistently staying out late with friends and drinking too much and just not getting enough sleep. Her lifestyle was hurting her and making her MS work worse. <laughs> I guess work as well. <laughs> as she calmed down, and her tears dried. She looked around her doctor's office. Her doctor had given her some orange juice to sip on to help her calm down, and the nurses were looking at her with sympathy. But she knew they couldn't help her, not really. Now, they were doing their part, right? They were treating her MS, they were doing a great job, but it clearly wasn't enough because relapses kept on happening. She realized that she needed to do her part too. So she slowly started changing her lifestyle. Now she didn't do this overnight. She didn't do a bunch of things all at once. What she did was she got therapy to manage her stress levels and work on unresolved issues that she had from her past. She started paying attention to her diet. She stopped the crazy restrictions and focused on whole foods and educated herself on how food works in her body. She had always worked out, but she took down the intensity that came from wanting to go run off 50 pounds 
and started doing it in a way that was kind to her body. She started listening to her body and what it needed and worked on honoring those requests. She made sleep a non-negotiable and she made her lifestyle and health her number one priority. As her lifestyle changed, so did her MS. Her symptoms and relapses came farther and farther apart. Her fatigue was way down. She didn't have any cognitive effects and her pain went away. She started to feel genuinely happy for the first time in a while. Now this story may sound pie in the sky, but this is a true story and it could easily be your story. Now, do you have something in your life that you want to change? And look, if you just said, yeah, no more MS, I totally hear you. I get it. But you have that power in your hands. Now, you can't cure MS, right? There's no cure yet. But I do have to say I'm very hopeful that in the next, you know, 20, 30 years, we see something very close to a cure because research is just amazing right now. And I also know that everybody's MS is different, right? This is the snowflakes disease. This affects everybody differently. But no matter what your MS looks like, lifestyle changes like exercise and diet and sleep and stress management and a whole bunch of other things can improve MS symptoms, sometimes quite drastically. And not only can a healthy lifestyle improve the effects of MS, but also an unhealthy lifestyle can worsen the effects of MS. So think about that for a second. You often think about healthy habits as being beneficial, and you really want to focus on the healthy habits, but bad habits that you may already do are having a big impact on your health as well. And you need, that needs to be changed as well. Unhealthy habits can worsen your MS over time, right? They can exacerbate symptoms. They can also increase chances of comorbid diseases like diabetes or obesity. And comorbid conditions with MS can increase progression and it can further decrease the quality of life. So this is not just about losing a few pounds or getting healthier because you think you should, right? For those of us that have MS, the stakes are so much higher. This is about slowing down the disease and being able to live the life that you want without it being drastically altered. So do you have something in your life that you want to change to help your MS? Why isn't it done? Why is it still in the to be changed bucket and not in the already done bucket? Right? And I want you to honestly ask yourself this question because the answer may actually surprise you. Why isn't it done? Tempting, it's tempting to say that it's because you're busy or there's not enough time in the day or you're overwhelmed, you don't have energy, you don't have support, there's no cash, you don't know where to start. But what if I told you that none of these things are the real reasons why you don't make those changes that you want to make? Not one of those things has to stop us. Now I'm going to go over the real reasons why creating new habits can be tough. For example, there's a surprising thing that stands in your way every time you go to create a bold new health challenge. And relying heavily on your doctor to create a healthy lifestyle can actually hold you back because your doctor is only a small piece of that puzzle. And we're going to discuss exactly what you can do to make creating a healthy lifestyle much easier on yourself. We're going to go over how our brains work when it comes to habits and what you can do to use that knowledge to your advantage. But first, I want to introduce myself a little bit more. You might be wondering who I am and why you should even be listening <laughs> to anything that I have to say tonight. Well, I'm Hendry Hansen, and I'm a Master Certified Life and Mindset Coach and Author. I wrote the books, Live Your Life, Not Your Diagnosis, and Stop Carrying the Weight of Your MS. And I understand that many people with autoimmune disorders can feel confused about finding what works for them to get better health. I offer coaching programs to help you ditch that doubt and find the right answers for you so you can get that better health and start feeling like yourself again. And that story that I told you at the very beginning, that was me. I've lived with multiple sclerosis for about 20 years. And when I was in graduate school, I poked my eye accidentally. <laughs> I was sweeping hair out from my face. And that night, my vision began shutting down in that eye. I had no idea what was going on. I thought maybe I detached my retina. I had no clue. So I went to an eye doctor in the morning. And she looked in my eye 
And then she walked me down the hallway to uh, a neuro-ophthalmologist. And he looked in my eye and he said, huh, you have optic neuritis. Now, again, I had no idea what that meant. But by that night, I was in a hospital room with my parents and my new MS specialist looking at pictures of my brain. And there were little white lights all lit up on those pictures, like Christmas lights. And my MS specialist said, you are on fire. And there's no doubt that you have MS. Now, those first years were really rough. As I tried to get this MS under control, I tried to understand this new body that kind of felt like an alien to me now. I had countless bouts of optic neuritis. I, I honestly could not tell you how many times I've had optic neuritis. It was a lot. I had a lot of relapses. And my low point was breaking down in tears in my neuro-ophthalmologist's office because I learned that I had optic neuritis again, and that meant another round of steroids. So that's when I realized that I had to take matters into my own hands. I realized that I had to do a lot on my own. My doctors were fantastic, but I had to meet them where they were. So I took an evaluation of my life. I was under tremendous stress, and I was dodging my emotions left and right. I was just pushing them down and, like, not wanting to feel them at all. And I was so invested in living like I didn't have MS. I was, kind of, I was trying to live up to how other people saw me. But the thing is, other people didn't see my MS. They might have known. I was open about it, but they didn't see it when they saw me. Even though I would be sometimes looking back at them with, like, one eye, they didn't know. And I was still trying to push it really hard at work and really live up to their expectations. I was going out late with my friends all the time. I was eating a horrible diet. I was burning the candle at both ends. And this was a daily activity for me. I was never getting enough sleep. I wasn't listening to my body, even though it was screaming at me. The biggest problem with my health was my lifestyle. Now, look, I didn't change this overnight. I didn't change this all at once. This is not a I made the decision and then just did it story. If anybody tells you they did that, they are lying. It's <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> I would fail a lot, and I would try a lot of different things. And what I would do is I would go make a decision to do something, and I would make a goal, and I would make my plan, and I would take action to reach my goal. But it wasn't working. I found that just setting goals to take action, no matter how small and attainable, right, how measurable these goals were, it wasn't working because goals were impersonal. And soon I would lose interest. I would get distracted. I would forget that I was doing something. I, would follow through. I wouldn't follow through. I just sabotaged myself. So I started looking at why this was happening. What was going on? Because I truly thought that this was how it was done. This is how you create new habits. But I learned that creating a habit was way more than just a goal. And there's something way more important than making smart goals, right? There's something you have to do before that. And I found a way to make any new changes be very personal and very important to me. And since my goals became super personal and important, they were also really easy to stick with. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you guys today. How to make your new habits way too important to brush off and really easy to stick with for life. So I'm always telling my clients to run their health like they would run a business. So all of your habits, your environment, your activities, your personal relationships, they should all work for you like employees at a Fortune 500 company. They should all contribute to your success in life. And like every great company, you should have board members advising you on how to be in the best health possible. Now imagine each board member represents a category of lifestyle changes, such as diet and exercise or stress management. And the board member doesn't have to be a person per se. It could be a practice. It could be a habit just something put in place to address that part of your life. So I'm a very visual person. So I like to imagine the boardroom table. All the seats around the table are filled with your personal board members. And again, each of these board members is going to represent a category of lifestyle change. It can be a current habit that you want to maintain, a future habit, or something that you would like to do to improve your life. So let's look how this is laid out. One seat, for sure, it can be your MS specialist. Hopefully, 
you have this seat taken. Another seat's going to be for other doctors. Maybe you have another specialist. Maybe you have a GP that you really like, something like that. But then one seat's going to be nutrition. Not necessarily a nutritionist, but books or research, trying out different foods, different ways of eating. So this board member is going to help you try to only eat whole foods and get off the processed foods. It's going to help you decide to go sugar-free or gluten-free or dairy-free or grain-free or any other free that you want to do. Right? It's going to be in charge of if you want to go plant-based or do something different. Another seat is going to be for sleep. Now, again, this doesn't have to be a specialist, but it could be your sleep routine and research on how to get better sleep if you're having issues. So this board member is in charge of your regular sleep-wake cycle, it's in charge of controlling caffeine or blue lights or your bedroom environment. Exercise is a board member. For me, this board member is the gym and classes. I like to be social. I like taking classes and stuff. My dog is also here. <laughs> She's a very high-energy dog. She needs two to three-mile walks every day. So my dog is at the seat of the table. So find what you like to do, walking, running, cycling, the gym, classes, whatever. Set a consistent schedule, creating goals. Um, that's all going to be under this seat. Maybe you need accountability. I do want to have a little caveat on accountability. If it works for you, it's fantastic. Find that accountability, find a partner, and really use it. But accountability partners and things like that don't work for everybody. There's a personality type that really, really likes it and really does well, and there's a personality type that just doesn't. I am actually a personality type that doesn't do well with accountability. Outside accountability, it kind of annoys me. <laughs> And that's just because I have internal accountability that really hums. And so when someone else tries to do something, it annoys me because I'm like, this isn't, like, you don't know. <laughs> so that might be you. Don't feel bad if accountability doesn't work for you because it might just not jive with your personality. So another seat, we've got stress management. That definitely has a place at the table, right? Professionals like psychotherapists, counselors, coaches. I have seen all of those. <laughs> Right? Practices like meditation or breathing, managing your mindset, managing your emotions, that's all under stress management. Relationships and support systems for sure is going to be at the table, right? Groups of people that have your back, strong personal relationships, strong boundaries around other relationships. For me, learning has a seat at the table. I always want to be learning something new. I always want to be educating myself. It can be for my business, it can be for fun, but I like to give my memory and other cognitive skills a workout on a regular basis. So this can be anything. It can be reading, it can be listening to audiobooks, it can be documentaries, it can be learning something new and novel like languages or dancing or <laughs> any kind of a new skill. You don't even have to be good at it. Just attempt to learn it, and that's enough to give your brain that workout. Pleasure absolutely has a seat at this table. I make sure each day I do something that I love. Usually for me, it involves being outside and enjoying this beautiful scenery that I have, but it changes. Sometimes it's something else, but having pleasure at the table is hugely important for me. So what would you do forever if money and time were no object? How can you bring a piece of that into your day? It could be socializing with friends. It could be being outside. It could be spending time with your pets, spending time alone, going to a museum. It could be anything. Now, there's a lot of other seats at the table based on what you're doing, right? These don't have to be the only ones. You could do massage therapist, acupuncturist, whatever it is. But no matter who you have at your table, you are at the head of your table. You are in charge, coordinating, being consistent, always checking in, following up on each one of these board members. You are the CEO. And you can see how doctors are only a small part of your board, right? Doctors can't make you change your diet. They can't make you exercise. They can't make you go to bed on time, right? You see doctors only a few hours out of the year, right? Even if you're staying in a hospital, like how often really does your doctor pop in? Like 15 minutes? like maybe twice, three times a day, right? You still only see them a little bit. The rest of the time, you're on your own. It's up to you to create new habits, to be consistent, to make that lifestyle change. 
but this is the best news ever because you don't have to rely on anybody other than you to make this happen. So is your boardroom table full? Do you have all your seats filled up? Now remember, I want you to ask this as an honest question. This is not to beat yourself up. This is not about feeling discouraged about what you think you should have done. This is about understanding why you're stuck when there's something that you want to do, but don't do it. So we just went over like what, six, seven categories and changes that you can do on your own. And I know none of these are novel. I know you've heard of each one of these. And you can always add other ones. But if you don't have all of these figured out, don't worry. Because look, the truth is nobody does. I don't. Because there's always something new to learn and apply and we're changing all the time. So whatever level you're working on right now, that's totally okay. Maybe you've got a handle on most of this and you just wanna fine tune some habits, that's great. Maybe there's some big holes like nutrition or stress management is empty, that's okay too. You can let certain seats remain open, fill them when you're ready. But I want you to be honest with yourself about why those seats aren't filled. Are you not ready because maybe you're working on another change and you want a clear view of what's working? Or are you not ready because you're procrastinating and you still feel stuck? Now I wanna highlight that the reason why you're not doing something that you want to do or you're procrastinating or you feel like you're sabotaging yourself isn't because you don't know what to do. It's also not because you don't have time. There's a reason why you get into, you get the yeah buts when you're starting something new. You know what I mean? Like the yeah, but I don't know how. Yeah, but I don't have time. Yeah, but it won't make a difference. Right? The reason why you're saying yeah, but is that you have a story about each and every one of these healthy habits. Now, what's a story? What am I talking about? Well, we all have a lot of opinions, right? We all choose what we want to believe about what's going on in our lives and around us. And often we have quite a few opinions <laughs> about any one circumstance, right? Otherwise known as a belief system. Now, a belief system doesn't have to be big. It can start with just a few thoughts. But these belief systems create a narrative or a story in our minds about what we think is true about something. So for example, you have a story about the last time you were waiting in line at the store. Probably that the lines shouldn't be so long. Who are all these people? They should be at work. The store doesn't have enough people working. Look at that one employee, they're way too slow. Maybe you go home and you tell the story to your partner later on. You talk about how horrible it was, how everybody was annoyed. It's a story. And we all have stories about everything in our lives, especially challenging things. We have stories about new habits that we want to start and why they're hard or impossible or something that we can't do right now. We have stories about being too tired and too busy. These stories are very logical. And chances are you haven't even questioned whether or not they're true. They just, they just kind of are. Now, I have to be honest. When I first learned about our stories and how they work in our brain, I got a little offended. <laughs> I felt like people were saying, you know, like I was a kid, like you're just telling stories, like I was lying or something like that. But that's not at all what this is about. This is just about how our brains operate. Because our brains love a story. Your whole brain activates when you're listening to a story, right? Hearing someone describe sounds and smells and common experiences, it makes you feel like you're there. And you have stories about everything from what you had for lunch today to what you think about your neighbor. I know I do. <laughs> I've got a lot of stories about my neighbor. <laughs> we all tell stories about our experiences. It's how your brain organizes information. Our brains are just wired for them. And the story grabs your attention more than just data. And in fact, when we're telling a story to somebody else, the same areas of our brains are activating. So it's literally putting ourselves in sync with each other. It's really cool. It's why Storytelling is studied heavily by people who want to influence and make big changes in the world, right? Researchers, speakers like Brene Brown, if you know her, she's into storytelling. And even CEO like Steve Jobs was huge into storytelling, right? The power to change is in the story. And you have a story about yourself. 
who you are as a person, who you are as a person with MS, what you're capable of, what you will or won't do, what you can and can't do, and why. These stories extend, extend to the changes that you want to make in your lifestyle, right? You have stories about what it means to go sugar-free or how hard it is or if you can do it. You have stories about being too busy to put anything off on your plate. Stories about how your life is stressful and how you can't escape it without quitting your job or getting divorced or running away or doing something quite extreme like that. These stories become very fixed, right? There's very little flexibility. You can get stuck without even realizing it. And this stuck, oops, this stuck fixed mentality is what really stands in your way when you want to change something about your life. So if you think about the last time you tried to create a healthy habit that didn't stick, you probably looked at the logistics, right? You figured out how to do it. You set a goal, chunked it down to those small steps, right? You probably had a smart goal. And then you started taking action, hoping to, to get a result. But you didn't address your story. And you tried to create something bold and new while still believing the old story and why you can't do it. So for example, maybe you've known for a while that you want to start exercising. But you've been thinking, I don't have time. I don't have the energy. I'm not even sure how to start. I don't like walking. It's boring. It probably won't make much of a difference. But then one day you decide to just do it. And you just power through your walk. And then you're like, okay, I can do this. I'm going to plan to do it two, you know, three times a week. I'm going to just do this. And you can. You can stick with it for a little while using pure willpower. But eventually you're going to start canceling your walk. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to miss two or three days in a row. And it's going to drop off. So why? Why does this happen? It happens because the whole time you're trying to start walking consistently, your brain is telling you the old story. This is too hard. This will never work. I don't want to do this. I'm bored. This is not me. And you get frustrated because working out is hard and boring and not you. And it's something you have to drag yourself to every single time. What makes your new habits easier is changing your story before you start anything. So what would happen if before you started walking, you believed a different story? You believed that walking was easy. It actually improved your energy so you can get more done. You can use it to listen to a book or podcast and learn something cool. Maybe it's time for you or time for just to socialize with friends or somebody else. When you have that story, going for a walk from that mindset is so much easier. And there's a much bigger chance that you're going to keep doing it. So changing your story is a crucial first step. Now, just as a negative story can hold you back, your more positive story can propel you forward. So a different story about a new habit can make you see it differently. It can make it easier and more doable. Your story can help you stay consistent because your belief system stays with you. Even if your current action stops, you'll start a different one because you still have the belief that you want to do it. And you're going to find a way to get it done and get that same result. So what does changing a story look like? There are two crucial components to a story. Number one, you must believe your story. Number two is a story that helps you must feel good. I'm going to talk more about feeling good a little bit later, but let's talk about believing your story. Because the only stories that work are stories that you believe. So whether you know, whatever story you have now about the habits that you want might not be the most positive, but you believe it. You believe it on its face to be true. So any new story must have to be, has to be something that you believe even more in order to counteract that current story. Now, this is why positive thinking can fall flat for so many people. Because what we try to do is think something that sounds pretty, right? We even repeat it over and over again to make ourselves believe it. But we don't. Not, not really, right? There's no faking it until you make it with positive thinking. And coming up with inspiring thoughts can be useful in the short term, 
And I promise you that happy thought is not going to give you a lifelong change. Right? Changing your story goes way deeper than that. If you don't believe your new story, no matter how pretty it sounds, your new story is not going to work. It's not going to made, motivate you or make anything easier. Our brains are a lot smarter than that. Right? You can't force yourself into believing something else. So what happens is we create a new story that sounds good. Like, hey, I, you know what? This is easy. I actually like working out. I just, I just went for that walk and it's fine. But we don't really believe it. So instead of feeling good and motivated, our brains are busy saying like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't believe that. And so no matter how many times we tell ourselves like, no, 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 this is really good. Our brains are going to counteract it with like, no, no, I don't think it's good. Right? If you try to make yourself believe something, it's not going to hold for long. And I know a lot of us try to start with positive thoughts to motivate us to just start, which is good. But if we don't really believe it, it's not going to last. You have to consciously change your story in your mind first and make sure you believe it for it to work for you. Now, the easiest way to change your story is to know why you want to make that change. Knowing why you want something makes it meaningful to you. It makes you sit up. It makes you take note because it's about you. It's not about impersonal data or something someone told you to do, right? When you have a deeply personal reason why, your story about what you want to do can change. And when your story changes, taking action becomes easier. But don't stop with just asking why once. Your brain's first answer is going to be very surface. It can be very logical. It's going to be something like, I want to work out because I want to lose weight or I want to help my MS. My doctor told me or I know it's a good thing to do. You know, your first reason will always sound very good and very true, and it might be. But you want to find that deeper reason why. You want to find that one reason why that maybe you don't think about too often. Maybe you're a little afraid to admit it, right? You want that reason why to give you goosebumps. So I use the tool called the five whys where you ask yourself why up to five times. Let me walk you through an example um, of when I was working with a client with this tool. She wanted to start exercising. And so I asked her why, and she started with that first reason that came to mind. She says, you know, I want my MS to get better. And I asked, why do you want your MS to get better? Well, because I want to be healthy. Why do you want to be healthy? So I can have the energy to keep up with my kids. Now, this might sound like a really good stopping point, but try to go a bit further when you're doing this. Dig a bit more. Ask yourself that five, those five whys. So when I asked her, why do you want the energy to keep up with your kids? And she says, well, I don't want to miss out on my kids growing up. Why don't you want to miss out on your kids growing up? Because I want my kids to have a mother that's always there for them. And that was the reason that gave her goosebumps. Right? Going a little deeper gets you there. It's personal. It gets right to the heart of the matter. It's truthful. There's no convincing yourself of the story. It's not like pushing positive thoughts. Right? You, this why is something that's deeply meaningful, and you already believe this. And I would argue this why for her was way more meaningful than just wanting her MS to go away. So this five why tool is also... Uh, helpful if you're trying to change your story from something that's super negative and super, super defeating, right? Sometimes we have something that we really want to do, but we believe that we just can't do it or we're feeling really frustrated. Um, and, you know, we're stuck thinking about, like, how to even get around this. It's hard. It's hard to go from that super negative place to a super positive place. But you don't have to make that huge jump. Just ask yourself why you want to do it. And keep asking yourself to find that deep reason why you want it. And as a side here, if you can't find a reason why that you want to do it, then maybe look at doing another habit. Maybe look at changing it up a little bit. So, for example, if your main goal is that you want to exercise, but you can't make yourself really want to walk, you can't find a good why <laughs> that you want to go walk, then drop the walking. Try something else, right? Pushing yourself to do something that you truly deeply don't want to do is not going to do you any favors, right? All roads lead to Rome, right? Any healthy habit is going to help you. Pick one that you truly want to do and start there. Now, there's two reasons why 
that you want your why to your new story to give you goosebumps. The first reason is that a good story harnesses the power of your emotion. A story makes us feel something, right? Happy, mad, sad, glad, that kind of thing. And you can't have a thought without then feeling an emotion based on that thought. It's just the way our brains work. Emotions are why you get invested in stories, especially in your own story that you tell yourself. It's why you pay attention. We all want to feel something when we're communicating, right? We're not robots. Reason number two is that when you're emotionally invested in something, you take action. Every action that you take in life as humans is based on either avoiding pain or finding pleasure. That's it. We're pretty simple. <laughs> Even if you think that you're doing something for someone else, you're still doing that because it feels good, right? Don't think you're, you're not selfish. <laughs> it's just the way we work. It's just the way our brains are wired, which is great because you can use that to your advantage. So a positive emotion will always lead to a positive action. And a negative emotion will always lead to a negative action or inaction, like procrastination. So if your story about working out is that you never have the energy, that story feels overwhelming, even depressing. What action are you going to take when you feel overwhelmed? Not much of one. But what if your story was, I'm making exercise a priority because I want to be able to travel the world? That feels unlifting, right? Uplifting, even inspiring. That's definitely one of my whys. It makes me feel really good every time I think about it. That positive thinking activates more areas of your brain. That positive feeling activates more areas of your brain. And you're more able to find a way to work out in a way that works for you. You can get creative. You can get it done. And you can take action again and again. And making your workout a priority is so much easier when you have a really good reason why you want to do it and you feel good every time you think about it, which makes the results that you want come a lot faster. So what results do you want to see in your life? I would guess the results that you want are to live a healthy life, maybe increase your energy, stay mentally sharp, move and be able to do things that you love, like activities with your family or traveling, if you want to be involved with your community, you might even want to live a, quote, normal life where you don't have to worry about your MS. Look, these are not impossible goals, but they all depend on healthy habits that stay consistent for your life. And the first thing we do to make these habits doable and easy to stick with is not create a plan of action. The first thing you do is you change your story. You change your story around whether these things are possible for you. You change your story around what you need to do and how easy it is for you. You change your story around how you're doing and what you've accomplished so far as you're working on your new habits. And the first step to getting a great story is asking yourself why you want these things. And keep asking yourself why until the answer gives you goosebumps. Now let's go back to that first question that I asked you. Do you have something that you want to change in your life? It can be anything. Maybe it's clean up your eating. Maybe you want to start working out. Maybe you want to work on your stress. Think about what that is. Now think about why you want to do it. Because whatever it is, it's possible. And you can start right now. I'm going to get you started by leaving you with an exercise. It's called Change Your Story. And you can do this tonight. You can do this right after we get off the phone. Now, this is what the layout is going to look, at, look like. You can get a fresh piece of paper out um, right now. I'm going to walk you through this whole exercise. And then in a second, I'm going to give you a link where you can just download this, this PDF. Um, it's a fillable, P, fillable PDF to help you if you want to. But right now, at the top of a fresh piece of paper, write down one change that you want to make today. What were you thinking of when I was asking you, what did you want to change? It could be anything. Be breaking a bad habit, it can be creating a healthy new one. And then down the left side, I want you to make a list of all the reasons why you want to do this. Remember, these all have to be true. There's no faking here. There's no pretty thoughts that you don't really believe. This list is 100% for your eyes only. Nobody has to see it. You can use the five whys tool here and try that out as well. 
When you have your reasons why, I want you to read over your first reason and pause. I want you to think about what you wrote. Notice how it makes you feel. And then write down next to it how it made you feel. So, for example, I want to travel. It makes me feel inspired, so I would write that down. Now, some things might make you feel like meh or kind of neutral. Like, that's okay. Write that down. <laughs> that's an emotion, too. But keep going all the way down the list, asking yourself how each one feels. And take the reasons, maybe like the top three reasons that feel the best, and write them on sticky notes. Write them on your computer. Write them on your phone. Put them where you see them every single day. Memorize them. Repeat these reasons to yourself every time you go to make that change. Let yourself feel the emotion that comes up when you think about your reasons. Really steep in it before you take that action. But the more you do it, the easier this is going to get because you're going to create a habit just on its own right there. Now, again, if you want the fillable worksheets, you can download it off my website, andreahansencoaching.com forward slash why. I'm also going to give you a worksheet for the five why and more information from me and bonus guides on other things that might stand in your way of creating healthy habits like how to stop feeling overwhelmed, how to get more energy, um, a cool resource on boosting your confidence. So if you want more, feel free to come to um, my website and download these PDFs and check it out. So when you do this exercise, you're going to end up with at least three reasons why it feels really good. And when you put these three reasons why together, it's the start of your new story. Your new story can propel you forward to making those consistent changes that can heal your body. Getting that reason why is easy when you open up to yourself, when you have that honest conversation and you look at things, even if it's scary. Allow yourself to change that story. Let go of the story that's holding you back, right? Remind yourself of the better feeling story that you believe even more. Let yourself be the hero here, right? When you make that shift, your world cannot help but change. And none of this is impossible. No matter what your starting point is, we're all starting from different places. And it's okay. No matter what that starting point is, you can do this. So I want you to go change your world. Thank you so much for having me. My hope is that your brain is just running with lots of ideas um, on what you want to get started on. And here, again, is the link to get those worksheets if those are going to help you so you can get started. And we're about to jump into questions. And I'm going to answer as many as you guys have. But feel free also to email me if you have a question that's not answered um, or if you think about one later. That's my thing. I always think about it like two days later. <laughs> I am happy to answer any questions if you want to email me, Andrea at andreahansencoaching.com. So Peter, if you're ready, do you want to dive, dive into some questions? We are ready. Uh, thank you, Andrea, so much. That was excellent information, uh, very insightful, and as you said, yeah, very actionable steps that, mm. that people can take and, and certainly use those worksheets as well. And just on a personal note, I love the 5Y tool. Um, yeah. And, and it, kind of, it kind of reminds me of when my kids were little and they would say, Dad, but why? But why? But why? Yeah. They, they were asking me your tool and they didn't know it. So how about that? Isn't that so funny? Yeah, that, that tool great. actually, that, that tool originally comes from, it's an old tool. They used it on, I can't remember the car maker, but they used it on the manufacturing line of a car. To, to find out exactly what the problem is. So it'd be like, oh, this car, the door isn't, isn't closing properly. Why? Oh, well, this, the, the springs aren't lined up. Well, why aren't the springs lined up? Oh, it looks like the screw isn't done right. Oh, why isn't the screw done right? Well, we got the wrong, right? And so they would use that to drill down and find out exactly the reason why and what they needed to change on that whole line of uh, manufacturing to get those cars back up and running well, so yeah that that's excellent and uh mm -hmm. I, I think, and, and the uh, the boardroom table i really love that it's a very concrete example you can see all the chairs around the table and the different yeah um that was fantastic 
fantastic. Great. Uh, we we did get a lot of questions, and actually one just came in as a follow up to what I was just going to ask you about in terms sure. of nutrition and diet. So yes. uh, one of the slides earlier listed a variety of different diets, uh, yes. gluten free, and then someone mentioned sure. about the Walls diet. So the the main question I've I've received was. Mm -hmm. I see all the diets listed, but how do I know which diet I should follow? Mm -hmm. Well, the short answer is none of them. <laughs> there is no one diet that's going to work for everybody. It's just not. All of our bodies are different. And so the way you find out what works for you is to really connect with your body and understand how things work in your body. So it's going to be a lot of paying attention to what do I feel when I eat cheese? What do I feel when I eat bread? What do I feel, right? So it's, it takes a little bit of time. It's not just a quick answer of something, you know, somebody else's research. It's really research on your own body to be able to fine tune it. And so what you're going to find is it's going to be like a hybrid. So for me, it's like I, my hybrid is, it's kind of, you know, it's like Mediterranean, but with some tweaks. Like it's not, I can't tell you that I'm on Mediterranean diet because there's certain things that I know that don't work for me. So that's probably what it's going to look like. It's going to be kind of a diet, and then it's going to have some tweaks, and you're going to realize, like, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, this isn't something that's working for me. Even though the Walls diet says it's okay, it's not okay with my body, and I can tell because I'm connected with my body. So unfortunately, you know, there's no, there's no short answer, but I can tell you that, you know, a better way is to not rely on what other people tell you is right for your body, and really connect and know what's right for your body on your own. Yeah, excellent. And really, it kind of mirrors what MS is. MS is just so individual yes. for each person. And no yes. one symptom is affecting each person. No one medication works for everyone the same. So I guess along the mm -hmm. same lines would be the diet. And I guess other wellness strategies exactly. in general as well. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. All right, so we had a couple questions around stress because that was a, another sure. topic you, you touched on. So one yeah. person uh, indicated that working is very stressful uh, mm -hmm. and, and retiring is not an option, so how can I help in that regard? And the other mm -hmm. person asked, how do I deal with stress triggers that can sabotage my thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it comes to being in a job where you're, you know, you feel like it's just too much for you, but you don't feel like you can – you can quit or do something else. It's all, again, it's all about how you're, how you're telling, what you're telling yourself about your job. It's all about your story about your job. That's really what is stressing you out. And, you know, I get it. I get having the bad boss. I get having the annoying coworker or, you know, coworkers that are really mean. Like, I have personal stories and I've heard a ton of stories from my clients. I get that we all have things like triggers. But ultimately, it's not what they're doing that's making us feel bad. It's how we're thinking about things. And so when you change your story, and it doesn't have to be like, hey, I love my boss. That's horrible. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like that. But when you change it a little bit just to get that charge and feel a little bit just more neutral about it, then when you're in that more neutral feeling place, that's when you're going to have the better chance of finding a solution right, finding a way to, uh, you know, make your job work a little bit better for you or do things, you know, maybe things outside of your job um, to help you get ready for your job so you have more energy or you have more of a, you know, more of a or less of a stress, I guess, you know, less stress so you can still do that same job but it's not taking such a, t such a toll on you. Um, the same thing goes for triggers right? Where the triggers that are happening are, are inside of us. But that's the most amazing thing because we can, we can change that, right? Like if you think about it, you know, when you're on a subway and some random person just starts yelling about, you know, you know something, you're, what are you going to think? You're going to be like, oh, look at that guy. <laughs> look at him getting all mad. Like, wow. You're not thinking anything of it right? Because your view is like, this guy has nothing to do with me. We can think that same way when it comes to people that are in our, in our lives, people like bosses. We can say, wow, look at, look at that boss. He's, she or he is getting super mad, super angry. 
but you don't have to get invested in that. And again, that helps you because when you are less invested, when you have a better story and you're feeling a little bit more neutral about it, you don't have to feel awesome, feel a little bit more neutral, that's when you can find your solution. And that's when you can change your circumstances or change different things within your circumstances in order to make it better. Right, okay, very good. Um, here is another question, and it really focuses in around, around cognition. Uh, so sure. The person writes, uh, my, my board table has all that you mentioned. I just cannot remember Great. very much. Uh, I cannot tell okay. my friends in the support system how I feel. How can you direct me with this? Tell me that last part. I can't tell my friends in the support system how I feel? Yes. Hmm. I... I have questions about that question. Um, <laughs> I would say um, a couple of things. So when it's coming to cognition and pure just memory and just, you know, remembering what it is that you're doing, um, that's where I would use something like a planner, get a passion planner or something fun like that, and really, you know, get your schedule out. If you're planning on working or on, uh, you know, walking Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like put that in your planner and get used to looking at that and writing things in there as you think about them. And even if it's like little, you know, I put little inspiration, inspirational notes to myself or I'll mark down like, hey, this, this is the day that I stopped eating sugar or, you know, whatever, for example. But using a planner like that, it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be like the planner you had in high school. <laughs> like it can be a lot more fun, but it can really help you remember when you're doing a lot of these things. You can track your sleep, you can track anything like that. As far as telling your friends and support system how you feel, that's something that's a little different. Um, I would say, um, just from that question, the best way is to be honest with how you feel and understand that just as we have stories about what's going on in our lives, our support system, our friends, our family have stories about what's going on, on in our lives too, right? Everybody has their own opinions. Everybody has their own belief system about what's going on. And so even though you can explain how you're feeling and you can open up to them, and if it's somebody that's really close to you and someone who's really empathetic, you can, you know, you can bond on that story. But you can't make someone believe something. You can't make somebody else feel something. That's, that's their job. So I would say, you know, don't have expectations about how other people are going to react when you do that. And that's why having people that are really close to you is, is important, having that support system and having boundaries as well. Yep, absolutely. Uh, another question kind of along the nutrition lines as well says mm -hmm. that uh, I cannot cook, so my husband does all the meal preparation, and we end up mm -hmm. eating a lot of processed food. How can yeah. I eat more healthy food and not insult him when he is so helpful to me? Right. Okay. So a couple, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. I think there's just the, the basics of how to not eat processed foods is maybe to talk with him about, I'm assuming if he's doing the cooking, he's doing the shopping, um, and talk with him about the best way to attack shopping, right? Staying on those outer edges of the supermarket. We've all heard about that. Um, you can help him with the, not necessarily the meal prep, but you can help him with saying like, hey, maybe tonight we try zucchini noodles, or maybe tonight we do this recipe that I found. And, you know, help him out like that. I would also say on the other side of that is not insulting him. And that goes back to just as you know, I've been talking about what your story is and how your story creates your own emotions and how you're in charge of changing your story and you're in charge of how you feel. Other people are in charge of how they feel. Other people are in charge of what they want to make things mean. So your husband is in charge of if he wants to make that mean that it's insulting or if he wants to make it mean that you actually just want to help by, you know, helping him get healthy too because look, this is not about MS. Let's be honest. This is about being human, right? All of these things are about being a healthy human. And something like processed foods, like I know diets are different, but something like processed foods, like that is a no diet. <laughs> that has no room for any, anything in nutrition. So 
you know, it's, it's really up to him as far as what he thinks and if he feels insulted. But I, you know, I, I would say just try to be helpful. Try to talk to him about going more whole foods. Talk to him about how that can help you get better. And talk about how maybe it can help him get better. I don't know how open he is to that. Okay, very good. And one last question, we'll, we'll end on this, and I think it's kind of a, a general uh, theme or advice for, for everyone really is uh, yeah. around motivation. And, you know, if people are going to uh, take on their story and, and changes in their life, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, MS is a chronic disease. You have this for mm -hmm. your life. You have to mm -hmm. change your habits. So the question is, how do I keep up my motivation? after starting healthy changes? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question because we can all start off with one story, but it might not be the story that we stick with. It might be that it, it helps us and it helps us for a while, like maybe it helps you for a good couple of months, but then something changes or you, you know, something else is introduced into your life and you kind of start to adapt to other stories about other things, and so your new story doesn't work as well. And you'll notice when your new story isn't working as well because you're not as motivated because that's the main thing your story is doing. It's like this intrinsic motivation for you. So when you notice that your motivation is starting to wane, revisit this. Go back and look. Maybe you have a new reason why. Maybe you, your reason why is okay, but what you're doing to get there isn't working for you anymore. Like, for example, for me, I – one of the first things I did when I was when I was diagnosed is I started working out. But I haven't done the same thing this whole time. I always have something that I'm doing, but it changes because I can't always get behind going for a run. I can't always get behind going to a certain gym class. I can't always get behind certain things. So my why is kind of changing a little bit. I'm a little bit flexible with it. Um, and I'm not afraid to change things. Like if, if I'm no longer motivated – to go out and go for a walk, I'll notice that and I'll say, okay, what's next? What else am I going to do? And how can I get behind that? So yeah, your why is like, like a living document in your brain. You always want to stay on it. You always want to keep on it. And when you feel that motivation waiting, give your, give your story a little refresher and change it up a little bit. Yeah, that's great advice because your story is constantly changing. So you have the yeah. power to, to change it and make it work for you in various stages of your life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, nothing is just like set it and forget it, right? I, I right. Sadly. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, Andrea, thank you so much. Uh, this does conclude our webinar for tonight. Uh, MSA would once again like to thank Andrea Hansen for her excellent presentation on this very important topic, as well as Celgene and Novartis for their funding support of tonight's program and our MS and the Family campaign. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar will be archived on our, web, our website at mymsaa.org within a few days, although the holiday weekend is coming up, so please give us a little bit of time. We'll, we'll try to get that as soon as we can. Uh, and we actually have a very brief survey that follows this webinar, so I encourage everyone to uh, stay tuned and take the survey, give us your feedback, we really like to know your thoughts on tonight's webinar and future topics that we could plan and put on our website as well. So for everyone from MSAA and certainly for Andrea as well, thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely.